Let's get started on this April, May 2022 Foundry VTT uh, mods video. In this video, we're going to talk about how I like to build a scene. So this is currently how I build a scene. This is not maybe forever how I build a scene. This has changed from when I first started uh, using Foundry. Um, and again, these are these are videos that may expire uh, in relevance very quickly because of how fast Foundry moves. But this is how I make a scene. So whenever I need a scene, I look at the maps that I'm going to need. Is the map tall, like a Zapiku scene, or is the map wide? Um, if it's square, eh, I generally just go with a wide map. But those are the two templates that I built for myself. So using Quick Insert, which is described in a different video, uh, I go and I look for my tile template. And you can see that I've added V9 because I'm on Foundry 9 now. So I'm looking for tile template wide in this instance. And I just drag it on over uh, or drag it to the folder that I want to work out of. And bam, I have my tile template. So I'm going to click on it. Uh, I've got some mods that are kind of trying to beat each other up. Uh, DF and Monk, uh, they all, uh, they both released so many um, amazing mods, but the mods all kind of do the same things. And I'm having trouble deciding who I like more. And right now they're sort of beating each other up. So it's hard to see, uh, maybe, with the resolution on your uh, computer, but there is um, a darker gray border area and there is a slightly lighter gray uh, border area in the center. Now, what I used to do for my tile templates is I would have a black tile in the back because um, I don't I don't know if I'm colorblind or not, but like I liked having the stark black background and the sort of light gray um, uh, bounding box or out of bounds area, and that black background allowed me to see very very clearly where the borders of my uh, files were but it ended up i ended up kind of getting rid of that and moving away from that because it felt like i just had yet another tile on the map that i didn't actually need so i've removed that from my tile template i also initially in my older tile template had a bounding box drawn of walls and i got rid of that as well um, because I don't actually know if I needed those walls and every single wall joint that you have in a scene is going to affect performance and even though it was only four uh, wall joints it, you know you cut corners where you can essentially so um, if we look at the settings for my tile template uh, basically I have nothing set for the background image I have nothing set yet for the preview image and my background is just a dark gray. My initial view is a nice wide uh, shot of the whole thing. And if I go over to grid, I just have the standard uh, grid settings here. And I have it 8,000 by 5,000. So it's going to be 80 by 50, which is big enough to accommodate most maps. Um, the reason that I'm working in 8,000 and 5,000 is because I have my grid set to be 100 pixels wide. Um, back in the Roll20 days, everything was 70 pixels. Um, I think 100 pixels is a little bit easier to do the math on after many years of having to uh, multiply and divide things by 70. It was refreshing to just be able to set everything at 100. It also makes it a lot easier for me to double the size of a map without affecting performance um, by going in and just dropping the grid size from 100 to 50 and then that effectively doubles the size of the map, which is great for giant-sized um, areas, like if you're fighting giants or titans, which seems to happen a lot in higher-level Dungeons & Dragons. Um, for lighting, the default settings that I have are token vision is on and unrestricted vision range is on. I don't have any of these other fancy bits on here. I have started, uh, once I sort of know what I'm building, going in and tweaking the ambient daylight color and the ambient darkness, but the defaults of white and sort of a navy slate color um, are just fine, and they do the job. The darkness level, I started at zero because it's easier to build that way, but almost always I do add a certain amount of darkness even to my daytime scenes. I have started adding some darkness to the maps, 
uh, especially if there are light sources there, because I want the light sources, even during the day, to sort of show up and um, be appreciated. Uh, these other settings for saturation and visit, uh, vision limitation I don't worry about. And then I do use a wall height mod, so um, I just keep that checked and good to go. For ambience, I just leave everything alone. And for terrain, um, I don't really mess with that either. Um, some of these options are showing up just because of the different mods that I have installed. So those are the kind of default settings of my personal... Um, tile templates that I like to use. And I call it a tile template because I prefer building my scenes with tiles um, rather than having um, background and foreground images. Now, don't get me wrong, background and foreground images are fantastic um, and a great way to do things. And a lot of map makers, um, especially ones that I enjoy following, have started kind of creating content that works really well with background and foreground images. Uh, Heroic Maps, for example, um, finally got into Foundry, and they got into it hard. And they've, uh, they have—they actually have um, Foundry products available for you to buy of their maps already set up for Foundry. And um, a lot of their newer products, you could just plug the background image in for the interior map and then the foreground image for the exterior map and use those native tools, make it happen. But in this instance, when I'm just trying to make a map the way I normally do, I use my tile template, and these are the settings that I have. All right. So once I'm in, I go to uh, tile controls, and I go to my folder, and then I go searching for um, the things that I need. So um, I believe in this instance, I was just going to um, bring over... Hmm... Here, we'll go into Princess Heist. And I will just drag over the roof uh, of the castle. Alright, so we'll drag that over. Nice. Um, and I believe the Princess Heist maps are supposed to be 50 by 50. So I drag this out, and I don't have a webcam on, so you can't see me squinting as I try to see the screen. Um, but... Uh, I'm trying to make sure that I am not in the dark gray area, that I'm staying in the light gray area. And I can see that I left some grid on this map, which means that this is probably, uh, probably needs to be uh, sized up or down. So I think it was either a 40 by 40 or a 50 by 50. Yeah, so it's a 40 by 40. So in order to reach that um, size, again, we use a 100 um, pixel grid. So to have 40 pixels, we need 4,000. So I do 40 by 40. And then I hit update. When you are moving this around, you will notice, I hope you can notice, because I'm zoomed in 250% here. Um, you will notice when I zoom in that I'm moving it around and it is not necessarily snapping to the grid, which is sort of a pain in the butt. What I do is I nudge it. So once I have the map generally where I want it to be, so in this case I'll put it just smack in the middle, um, I will, while it's selected, use the arrow keys and just kind of move it left and right. And when you move things with the arrow keys in Foundry, it always snaps them to the grid. So now I have this map snapped to the grid. I have all this extra space outside. Well, why would I need this space if I also have the margins? A couple of reasons. One... It keeps the players guessing. So the players arrive on the scene and they see that they're in a really small map, but they kind of pan their camera around and they see that the scene itself is pretty big. They start to wonder, are there hidden areas? Is there a basement area we can get to? Uh, does this tell there are going to be teleporters that lead us to more areas? Did he include multiple maps on the same scene? Or was he just being himself and using the template that he always uses and we've just got one map and then all this empty space? They don't know. Um, and I think that's kind of cool. I like the idea of getting to, as a player, getting to a map and not really knowing just how big the map is. Like, this is the map that I can see, but maybe there's more to the map than I can see. Maybe there's secret areas that we need to find. It leaves some ambiguity there that's really cool. It also allows you as a DM to sort of stash things um, off map. Uh, sort of like having a Dungeon Master screen and your minis are hidden behind the Dungeon Master screen. 
So the next step after I get the map in and I have the map snapped to the grid and it's the right size is I go to my wall tool. And then I have um, curved walls uh, installed. So I go to the square version of curved walls and I go to the force snap button and I just draw a nice little box around them. And then I hit the little checkbox. So now that I have this bounding box, I can then go grab a, a test dummy, which I highly recommend you have some test dummies. And the test dummy has sight enabled. And I can see that I can see the whole map, because that's the settings, but I can't see outside the map. So anything could be outside this map. So this is a great place for me to drag in monsters that they haven't encountered yet. I could drag over some journal entries, so I have a shortcut to the journal entries, but they remind me that there's going to be um, some, you know, some stuff that I, I need to do. I look over in the margins here, and I see that there's a, a little thing that says um, traps in this area, or treasure in this area, or read this to your players. Um, just, you know, notes to journal. Maybe there's a boss fight, and I have a journal entry that explains to me, hey, remember to do this stuff with the boss because it's complicated boss. I have all that information there and I don't have to necessarily go anywhere else for it. Now there are mods like this lovely GM screen down here that we'll cover in a different video um, that can be used to stash that sort of information. But at the same time, if you have all this extra space, all this like um, hidden area, it doesn't hurt to just do, you know, throw your stuff there. Now, if you are building your scenes like this, you want to make sure that your players are not dragging their own minis out onto the scene. <laughs> um, because, God forbid, they miss the map and they drag themselves into the, uh, essentially, like, behind the scenes area, the backstage area, and they see there's a giant monster, and they see that there's this notes about treasure and all the other kind of stuff. You don't want that to happen. So um, if this is the style that you decide to build your maps in, um, make sure that you are the one dragging people onto the scene so there's no accidental spoilers. Um, sometimes if something is really important and I don't want to spoil it, even if it's in the margin, I'll still make it hidden just in case somebody ends up in the margins and I don't want them to see what's going on. All right. Um, now that I have a map in the scene and I have a bounding box around the map, um, I will generally leave the grid up if I am drawing walls. Fortunately, I've chosen a map where I don't need to draw walls. We'll cover like walls and stuff in a different video. Um, but uh, I, my next step before I turn off the grid or change the grid would be to put in the walls. So I'd go around, put all the walls in. Then I would go up uh, back to the tile setting and I would copy the URL for the map um, I would go up here and access the stuff, and in this I would put uh, PH Rooftop, because this is the Princess Ice Rooftop. And then for navigation, I would put Castle Roof, because that's what will show up for the players. You might want to give a scene a name that makes it easy to sort in your compendium and find in your compendium, but then for your navigation name, you might want to put one that is more evocative to the adventure. Um, you certainly don't want to have the navigation say final boss chamber um, if you don't actually want the players to know that they have access to the final boss chamber. Um, so that's why you would go in and change the navigation name to be different than the scene name. Um, here you can also make this automatically show up in your navigation. So if this is a map that you plan on using soon, rather than having to go over and search for it, you could put it in navigation and then it will be available uh, up here. Uh, you can even, if it is a player-friendly map, maybe this is the player's castle that they received as a reward from uh, completing a quest, you can make this a player map, and then it will always be available um, to your players, and they can go visit it whenever they want, uh, which is something I love about Foundry. So down here, I have something called Preview Image Override. I believe this is a drag and flag in mod that allows me to have thumbnails for my scenes. So I'm just going to go ahead and post in the map itself. Um, so that I have a cool, evocative thumbnail that helps me remember what the scene looks like and what the scene is about. I'm a very visual person, so that helps me out quite a bit. 
All right, I don't need to change the initial uh, view, but maybe in a different scene I might. So if the players are always going to start in the same place on the roof, like maybe they got dropped off here, um, you know, they were airdropped here and this is going to end, I might zoom in close to the roof and then set my initial position. So every time the scene loads, it's always going to load with this exact look. So zoomed in this close on this particular part of the map. Uh, going over to the grid, there is already a grid on parts of this map. Um, I really don't like the look of the stark white here. So I might go and choose a different color. Uh, in this case, I'm going to pick blue. And then I'm going to... Um, oops. Uh, let's see. Leave that alone. Padding percentage. All right. We're going to go to grid opacity. And I'm going to lower that all the way down to like 0.45. Cool. And you can see it kind of update live, and you can still see the grid, but overall, it's not as stark and hard on the eyes as the um, the solid white was. So then I go over to lighting, and this is happening daytime. I could leave it white if I wanted to, or I could go and say, hey, it's like summertime, so I want there to be sort of a yellow sun situation going on. So I might go and um, sort of make this a little bit more yellow. And immediately, you can see it overlays that yellow across the whole scene. So it's very, very sensitive, right? So just a little bit of off-white suddenly changes the entire feel of the map. Um, if I was trying to take this seemingly nice um, World of Warcraft alliance, you know, blue and silver kind of thing and make it look a lot sh spookier, I could even go to like a red color and then have sort of this red haze. Like, you know, this castle is located um, near a mountain and the mountain suddenly erupted. So now we've got like this kind of red haze from this volcanic mountain. It can be that easy to change the entire mood of the map just by messing with the day, uh, the color settings on your ambient lights. It's wild. Um, same thing for nighttime. This, this applies a very nice bluish purple cast to everything when it's nighttime. Um, but maybe this, um, this whole area is located in a forest. So I want to switch this to be a greenish color. So then I sort of simulate the um, the shade of the forest kind of uh, and the light filtering through the foliage, you know, cast everything in sort of a greenish color. So those are, you know, things that you could do. Uh, in this instance, we'll just go with the sort of uh, dark blue purple effect. If I do raise the levels, you can see that it suddenly becomes night and that color for the darkness is overlaid on top of everything. Back in the Roll20 days, I had a, a thing called a night filter, uh, and it was basically just blue and purple um, kind of gradient cloud that I created in Photoshop with a very low opacity, and it was a tile that I would lay over the map to make it nighttime. Well, I don't have to do that anymore. All that's built into uh, Foundry, which I love. Um, in this case, it is daytime, and it is on the roof, so I'm not even going to have any dimness at all i think i'll probably just leave it uh fully lit or maybe just a little a little hint there a little hint of darkness uh coming through and that's all i need for this if i wanted to throw in some music or have an ambient journal scene or something like that i could um but i don't have to and as far as weather effects go i like to use a weather tool which we'll look at in another video um but this is basically how i set up uh, a scene in foundry not the best way just my way